This is Sarah Grimm from the Wisconsin Historical Society, and we welcome you today to today's hot topic webinar about preserving and protecting audiovisual audiovisual files. This is a continuation of this year's COSA Preservica Partnership webinars that started in January and will continue all the way through June. Please note on this schedule that we have two more webinars coming up in May and another in June. Two of these are the hot topic webinars which are more internally focused on key preservation issues for archive staff. Um, the next one is going to be about uh, preserving digitized state government records, which in discussions among ourselves, we are all running into. Um, everybody's heading down that path with great exuberance, so that'll be a great discussion. Um, and then best practices in digital preservation and international perspective, where uh, we are gonna have some guest speakers from um, Europe, um, all over Europe, just kind of talking about how things are going over there and things on their radar and things that we might know, not know about. Um, so that ought to be really fascinating as well. <clears throat> and then on May 23rd, under the briefings, we are going to have a webinar on the governance of long-term digital information. Um, we are gonna target senior managers and budget administrator types from state agencies on that one. Uh, we have some great guest speakers, both from COSA and from NASIO, um, as well as uh, some a case study um, for that one. So if you're interested in any or all of those, please sign up. We welcome you um, to forward them on to others who might be interested as well that you might benefit. Uh, we are going to be recording these webinars, so both the recordings and the slide decks are going to be available on the website, at, which you see here at the bottom of the page. Uh, they are usually up within a week or so, so just check back. Also at the end of this webinar, we are going to have a brief survey, and it would be fantastic if you could take a couple minutes to fill that out. We are going to be asking about uh, the webinar in general, things you want to hear about, but also what kinds of AV, AV files are you currently struggling with, um, what your situation is in your organization, and a little bit of uh, information for our Education Committee and uh, Siri in general would be very helpful there. So as we're moving along today, please feel free to send questions to us via the chat or the QA boxes, and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. So moving on to today, today's presenters, <laughs> David Portman's going to be leading us through today's presentation. David uh, joined, is, our, is one of our key uh, Preservica partners, and he joined the Preservica staff at the start of 2016 to promote awareness and education of digital preservation. And he's worked with uh, global organizations transforming the management of IT assets, services, expenses, and usage. Joining David is Rachel Vatz, who is head of the Special Collections and Archives at Berea College. Rachel holds a master's degree in library and information studies with a concentration in archival administration from the University of Wisconsin Managed Medicine, so go Badgers. She's also a council member for the Society of American Archivists and has served as the director of the Archives Leadership Institute since 2013. We are also very pleased to be joined by Kathy Carmack, who has worked at the Tennessee State Library and Archives for 30 years and has been director of the Archival Technical Services section since 2006. She oversees the acquisitions and processing for both state records and private manuscript collections. And Kathy is also the 2016-17 president of Nagara. And our final speaker today is Tim Hodge, who joined Preservica in 2016, and he works closely with the private and public sector organizations. Prior to that, Tim has 25 years of experience as a software engineer and sales engineer in the business intelligence and search in industries. So we are gonna move along and I'm gonna turn it over to David, and he's gonna lead you through today. Excellent, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, a very big hello to everybody, and a very warm welcome to all of you today. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity, before we get into the agenda, just to say uh, Preservica is absolutely delighted to be working alongside COSA uh, in this practical digital preservation web webinar series. And, you know, Sarah showed some of the great sessions we've still got to come in this series, so please do tune in for those um, as we approach the next few months. So I'm going to be your host for today, um, and I'm going to be doing a quick introduction and then ha handing over to, to our, our speakers um, to get us started. 
Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Preservica, uh, Preservica is a specialist in digital preservation software. Uh, I've got over a decade of experience in the field of digital preservation. Um, we have over 100 organizations from across the globe uh, making up our user community, um, and that does include 18 US state archives. So as you heard from Sarah, we do have some fantastic speakers, and we're really privileged to have the guys join us uh, for today's session. Um, they're going to be talking through and providing some real, real world examples of great work that, that they're doing in, in their in their organisation. So looking back on the agenda here, then. So first up, uh, we've got Tim Hodge, and Tim's going to be taking us through some of the best practices. Uh, for protecting AV files. Tim's going to be covering some of the challenges that they present, uh, the complexity and why why they need to be handled differently to other other formats. Um, and Tim's actually going to go on and, and move on to talk about the different formats you should consider and also touch on storage planning as well. So following Tim, uh, please say we've got Kathy Carmack uh, of the Tennessee State Library and Archives, and Kathy's going to be walking us through their use of uh, legislative, legislative recording program. Um, and then finally, uh, we have Rachel Vags from Berea College, uh, and Rachel's going to be talking about how, their, um, how they conducted a huge project to move over 100 terabytes of AV into the cloud, uh, ensuring it's protected and accessible uh, for the long term. So some great sessions coming up for you guys. Um, as Sarah said, we have got a Q&A uh, at the end of today's session. So please do, while you're hearing the speakers uh, present, think of any questions you've got and use the chat and Q&A um, functionality in the WebEx client to, to ask those questions. And we'll address those along with some next steps at the end of the session today. OK, so with that quick introduction and overview of the agenda completed, I'm going to hand over to Tim. He's going to get us started. Tim, over to you. Okay, thanks a lot, David. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm going to kind of uh, kick this off a little bit by talking to you all about some of the best practices uh, that um, that that we deal with with our customers, having to do with um, having to do with these AV files, which can be very challenging for a number of different reasons. Um, now, I was doing a little research just before I got on uh, the call here today and uh, just for the fun of it to see how much Internet traffic is actually streaming. And I learned that 70% of all bandwidth in the Internet is used up by streaming content from four different organizations. You probably can guess what they are. You probably all use them. Netflix, Amazon, YouTube, and Hulu. And now... I bring this up because this is important because uh, the amount of uh, attention that is paid to uh, audiovisual content over the internet is absolutely huge, and these organizations really need to make sure that uh, they can stream this content in an effective way. And because of that, there's a lot of research going on uh, into these kinds of files, and that produces lots of change over time. So it's important to, uh, to understand what the files are that you have, um, how to preserve them, and then how to uh, protect them in the sense that you want to always be able to have the best access copies uh, possible. So um, now, like I mentioned before, um, sort of alluded to already, the formats change frequency, uh, frequently. And uh, because there's lots and lots of research being done on different ways to uh, compress these files. So the landscape's just always changing. So it's important to have your files um, organized in a way so that when new technology comes around uh, that you could make use of in order to um, deliver your content in a better way uh, that you can uh, take advantage of that. Um, and having the, your files organized in a good way is really um, the best way to do that. Um, and uh, that, that way you can always uh, kind of uh, stay, either stay ahead or, or at least uh, um, be, be a, a, along with the technology that, uh, that is up and coming. So um, why are these formats complex? Well, um, 
most of these video uh, formats that you see, the ones that you might be most familiar with, like MP4, um, you know, uh, QuickTime files, which are .move files, they're really containers, and they contain a number of different things. They, um, they have, um, you know, the uh, video as well as um, audio streams uh, within them. And they're all, all of them are different, and they have different kinds of compression. And in, depending on how, you know, how that, uh, those files were created, whether they were uh, born digital or whether you uh, put them through a, a digitization uh, process, you get um, uh, different kinds of content, different uh, um, resolution. Uh, that you need that you need to be able to deal with. So again, that's uh, that's a constantly changing uh, um, landscape. Um, now, um, e e each of these um, uh, containers, let's see, I mean, uh, are really there's been a lot of them around, and we're developed a lot. A lot of new ones are being developed all the time. And each of these are used in, in different ways for different reasons. Um, MP4 is very good for, um, you know, for, for streaming content like on YouTube. But then there's some new formats out there, um, MKV and MXF, which are used for um, developing, editing, uh, broadcast quality type, um, uh, um, type content. Now, really, the question really comes down to what is it that, um, what kind of formats are you looking for? Um, what do you want to use? What do you have? What do you want to use? And really, the two big questions you want to, you want to answer is, how am I uh, going to deliver uh, the content to end users? What's the access format that I need? And also, what is the long-term preservation format that I want to use? And um, that's really the thing that you want to look at because the access copies need to be uh, compressed and small so that they can stream easily. And the long-term preservation copies really uh, what what you want to uh, focus in on here is to be able to uh, protect and save these like very high-res files. Sometimes they're very large. I've worked with a lot of companies that have uh, that have terabytes, hundreds of terabytes of video information, and it's a very raw kind of uh, um, broadcast quality uh, um, content. And they want to save it, but they don't necessarily want to uh, deliver that, um, you know, to end users. So that really um, brings me to the idea of storage solutions. How how to come up with your uh, storage solution um, paradigm, which is for access copies, you want to use a very fast uh, format like uh, uh, AWS S3 or Azure, which can deliver um, uh, uh, on a low latency kind of um, uh, format and, and make sure that your streaming comes uh, very quickly uh, and uh, users have a good experience. Um, but for for the um, for the for the large uh, raw files, those can be put out on uh, dark storage such as uh, AWS Glacier, which a lot of my customers use for uh, for their large video files, which really are only accessed every now and then if you have like a, a person who's a documentarian or someone like that who wants to uh, to do editing. But it, it's not really important how quickly they get the files, just that they can get them. So those are really the, uh, the, the two major things that you want to look at when you're trying to decide, how do I want to store uh, my video content? So really, um, in summary, you really want to understand uh, you know, what, what you want to use your files for, uh, in, in the sense that, you know, what kinds of access copies do I, do I want to have? How compressed do they need to be? Uh, how, many of them, how many of them do I need to have? A lot of my customers will edit the large raw files first and put them into small chunks. And then what's the appropriate uh, storage option uh, that, that uh, I'd like to use? And those are really the things that you need to consider with, uh, 
the um, with your um, video and audio files. So I think uh, I think that's it for me. Next, we're going to have uh, Kathy. Okay. Uh, I think you're going to have to drag the ball to me. There you go. Thank you. Yes, I think it's there now. <laughs> uh, yes, it is. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the um, legislative recording program that we have at TSLA. Um, it's a very um, long-lived program. We started back in 1955. They actually started testing in 51, so we have those test recordings as well. And they started with autograph discs, which you see in the picture. They were a very thin blue, uh, basically a record, and the machine would cut grooves um, into those discs. And you see on the front of the machine a, a piece of paper with a horizontal line. That's the minute counter. Um, we actually, I think we still have one of these that still works. Um, we have several that we've um, stolen parts from. Um, but became very, very difficult to keep these running. Um, so we switched to audio cassettes in 1974. And also, uh, the, the, that first 20 ish years of the program, we were only recording the House and Senate sessions. So we slowly started adding committees as uh, committee chairs would um, agree and allow us to do so. And all of these autograph discs that we had um, got converted to audio cassette also during this time. So the next milestone was we were starting to get really worried about space, and in 1987 we switched to recording on half-speed machines, still using cassettes, but it allowed us to store twice as much material. And you'll see a picture of one of those machines here coming up shortly. Um, and then we went along. And in just, I'd say probably 2004 and five, there was a very big scandal in Tennessee involving some of our legislators that some of you may remember. And that resulted in an Ethics Act passed in 2006, which actually put our program into state law. And it's still there. Um, it increased our coverage by adding every proceeding that they have, standing committees, joint committees, study committees, all the subcommittees, um, we literally cover everything they do. Um, and they also gave us two additional positions, which was very helpful. So it really kind of solidified the program and that the legislature considers our program to be the program of record. Um, even they, though they do some video streaming now. So by this time, the program had gotten so big that we knew we were not going to be able to continue as we were much longer. So in 2008, we went digital. Um, and there's a couple of key things that you need to know. Um, Tennessee is a legislative intent state, which means that these are permanent records. And we have all of the recordings since the inception of the program. It's, um, they can be used as evidence in court. Um, we certify the recordings as true and exact copies. Um, they are heavily used by lawyers across the country and not just the legislators, um, members of the public. Um, our recorders have had to testify in court before. So they're very important records. Um, the other thing that is crucial to our program is that we create a very detailed log sheet that accompanies the recording. Uh, it's not a transcription, but it includes an awful lot of information, including bill numbers that are being discussed, speakers' names, questions, um, all the various legislative actions that are taken. So those are very important um, pieces of information for users to be able to search and to be able to find the part of a proceeding that they need to listen to. 
Um, here you see a staffer, uh, this was about 2007, he's using one of the half-speed recorders, which um, lets you, would move from one cassette tape automatically to the next one, so you didn't have to manually do that and you wouldn't miss anything. And you can see um, he's there on the laptop, we would uh, plug into the legislature's audio system. Um, so. As we went along, we were starting to see more and more problems. The cassette tapes, and we produce two for every recording, a master and a reference copy, but they were growing by leaps and bounds, taking up massive amounts of space. It was getting very difficult to purchase cassette tapes, blanks, in bulk, of good quality. Um, and we had run out of space in our temperature and humidity controlled vault, so we were no longer able to keep them in that kind of storage, which increased the potential for deterioration. Um, other issues, as I said, this was such a heavily used collection, so we were having to regularly migrate two new tapes using high-speed duplicators, which is, um, couldn't cause problem in and of itself. Um, we had a lot of requests for copies uh, and we had to charge for those cassettes or ask customers to provide their own. And really, uh, the recordings were only available for use in-house and it, it could get pretty expensive to order copies. Um, that didn't phase many of our, our users, which might be law firms, but um, still, that was um, something that was hard for our users to navigate. So what we ended up doing was, as I said, going digital, but that was kind of a foregone conclusion. It was more of a question of how we were going to do it. And after a great deal of research, we ended up choosing a digital court recorder system, or DCR, that is put out by BIS Digital. And uh, what it does for us, it allows us to produce the logs as the recordings are made and they are linked to the audio. So we, with a keystroke combination, produce a tag as each new bill discussion or whatever it may be happens and then the, our users are able to jump to whatever they want to listen to. So the, the DCR um, reference copy, and that is the extension DCR, um, is proprietary and it comes with a free player. This makes it easy for us to send um, recordings and the player to users by email. Um, we also export the recordings um, to a WAV format to create a master, and then we uh, export the log information as text file for a master. Now those are, or when we do that, they're no longer associated, uh, but we have masters of each type of information. Um, we are going back and slowly digitizing the older recordings, but we still have everything that we've ever produced since these are permanent records. So the digital portion since 2008 is extremely easy for our patrons to use and that's wonderful and we still have all uh, the prior formats we produced um, we're not stuck with only a proprietary file type um, and our physical tape storage is no longer growing, which is wonderful. This is, we have eight stack levels. This is a back wall of one of our uh, stack levels that you're seeing and I'd say we have tapes like this on probably five of the eight, um, including all the masters and the reference copies. Um, so it, it makes for a lot of stuff. Um, so we are a Preservica state and we are loading recordings into Preservica. Um, we're still playing with the access piece. Um, we obviously can't 
provide access to the DCR format reference copies due to licensing issues, but we're experimenting with ways to uh, provide access to the waves and texts um, by exporting the text files with running time so the user can see where they need to go. Um, there is an issue with uh, Preservica's plugin that I believe they're working on related to fast forwarding, which is something that we would need. Um, so we're still in the experimentation for providing, providing access for these online, but just to be able to preserve them in, in such a system is a wonderful thing, and to know that they're not just sitting out there on the network um, and things could be happening, um, corruption of files and what have you. Our network storage situation, uh, because these are very large files, uh, has always been a concern, but it has greatly improved in the last year or so. We had an overhaul of our IT, which is a departmental IT, of which we're a division. So um, there, response to our needs is greatly improved, and that's a much better situation. This, by the way, is Patsy Mitchell, our electronic records archivist here working in a Preservica screen with waves and text files. Um, so I don't know how much our experience will translate to anyone else. It's kind of a, a it has always seemed to us to be a very unique program. It's so extensive, uh, it's been going on so long. Um, but I think you just need a lot of research on what's going to work for you and your users. Um, and it, we took a lot of time with that. Um, and, and thinking about what our needs were going to be into the future. But of course, that, that can change. It's already changed a lot since we went digital. So we're constantly thinking about um, how we're going to need to change things as we go along. And as we run into access online issues, um, you know, we may tweak things into the future. Um, and I'd say the biggest thing is to make sure you have access to the technical expertise you need, whether it's your your IT staff or your archive staff, um, have the training, and uh, that's something that we've had difficulty having departmental IT um, and experiencing somewhat of a lack of understanding of our particular needs because we were unique among the divisions of our department as a library and archives. So just being sure that you can get at that technical expertise and these webinars and, and other resources that you have out there are great for that. Um, and glad to answer any questions at any time about our program. So I will hand it over to Rachel now. And there you go. Take it, Rachel. Thank you. Okay. So um, I want to share a little bit today about our situation of preserving our traditional music collection at Berea College. Um, the collection is um, primarily documenting Appalachian history. Um, it involve, includes a number of types of materials, um, but our song archives includes traditional music, religious expression, spoken lore, radio programs, oral histories, and then many, many, many recordings of events that have taken place here at the college, some of which are musical in nature. Um, we have a long-running celebration of traditional music. So over the last 10 years or so, uh, we have been digitizing our analog AV collection. We were fortunate to receive external funding to begin digitizing that collection, and now about 90% of it is digitized. Um, we currently have approximately 110 terabytes of audio and video digital content. And at the end of that digitization project, um, our funder wanted to know how are we going to be preserving it? So the next phase of the project was to begin to explore what we could do. Um, we have extremely limited 
IT support here. There's no I dedicated IT in the library at all. And the college staff is just frankly not terribly large and has a number of other systems. So we were looking for something that would be cloud-based. But at the same time, it had to be a robust solution because the collection is enormous for an institution our size. We have 1,600 students undergrad. Um, there are three archivists here, and none of us had technical expertise. So we started beginning our explore, started to explore options the fall of 2014. We did have funding to hire a digital archivist. At that point, the funding was for one year, um, who would assist us in that process. The project was also running simultaneous with um, the, implement, the selection and implementation of a new collection management system. So the digital archivist had responsibilities for both of those things. We tested a number of options. Um, we were part of the beta testing phase of Archimatica, and then we also looked at Preservica. We, at that point, engaged a consultant. We had worked with AB Preserve um, on some initial digital uh, preservation planning and had them look at what we had been doing so far and, and help us write a report that would go to the college to the library um, and help make this decision about what system we would select. In the end, um, we did end up selecting Preservica for two primary reasons. One was um, it had the it was robust enough that it could handle a collection of our size, and also because of the development of universal access, we were planning to develop our own um, front end, and so this simplified our project slightly. So we moved all of our content from one and two terabyte drives to new five terabyte drives um, and literally sent them off via UPS to Amazon Web Service for the direct upload because, of course, we did not have enough bandwidth to upload our 100 terabytes here off of campus. So uh, over the course of a number of months, um, the materials moved from a processing area at AWS into our production module. We had uploaded uncompressed video, uncompressed audio, and then accessed copies of the video. This is pretty much how our universal access looks right now here on this slide. So our problem, our problem was solved, or was it? Um, we soon discovered that our plan to create the access copies of the audio did not work because our preservation plan was to keep uncompressed AV files on Glacier and the access version of S3. And there were issues that have been resolved with us creating a access version off of Glacier. Um, we also had uploaded the files with their log numbers as file names, but there was very little other metadata um, that came with the files. And of course, our digital archivist, um, whose funding had been extended from one to three years, got a permanent job um, somewhere else with 11 months to go on the project. So what are we doing to fix all of this? Um, well, at this point, my role changed from the top level project manager, um, department head, to the day-to-day -day manager of digital preservation systems. And when I was first asked about doing this webinar, I said, you understand I'm an extremely novice user, so I can't be run in as some sort of expert. Um, I was able to get up to speed using some training opportunities that are presented, and I am assuming at this point I probably hold the record on submitting health tickets. Uh, we were able to redirect the remaining money in our grant to contract again with AV Preserve uh, to direct the more technical work on the digital preservation program, uh, the migration that we were planning from Content DM, and also the implementation of our collection management system. And for that project, we had selected Archon. Uh, this has all worked pretty well because AV Preserves has a wider and deeper breadth of experience than we had on our staff, and even we had a great digital archivist, but even a wider breadth of, of experience than he had. Um, and that has helped us find some great solutions to some of our problems. It also, when we've gotten ourselves into a time crunch, has allowed us to put more resources in a short period of time into the project. 
One of the things we've do, done to resolve our metadata issue in universal access um, is that we have, because we've been able to go in and part of the project was to create de really detailed box inventories, we find that we are pushing more access to our digital content through our collection management system. Um, and that has mediated that need somewhat, but we are still working um, both with AV Preserve and Preservica on a mass ingest of metadata. Um, we also are making recommendations for some improvements. The inability to scrub through the video and audio um, files is, is an ongoing issue for us and is a, is a major user usability issue. So um, I say that hindsight is 2020, and this is actually a picture of, of my shop teacher, Mr. Jagger. You know, measure twice, cut once. Um, if I had to do it all over again, <laughs> um, I think that I would have done better planning um, for our ingest to begin with. But honestly, with the constraints of staffing that we had at the time, and a grant deadline that we were working on because we had a time specific that content had to be in the cloud in a system um, and that was really non-negotiable. I honestly think that we did and the people we've worked with have done the best that we can. So I will hand it back to you, David. Okay, thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, and thank you to all of our speakers uh, from today. Um, so just a very quick recap then. So first of all, we heard from Tim um, on the complexities of managing AV files and actually the importance of knowing how you're going to use the content uh, to help you with that, with that uh, kind of support and planning phase. And also Rachel's just reiterated that again. Um, so really some fantastic insights from Kathy and Rachel today, um, covering some of the hurdles they've overcome. Um, and actually the solutions they've put in place uh, to protect the AV and make it accessible. Um, and I just want to touch back, actually, Kathy made a really good point on streaming videos in regards to the ability to fast forward content. Um, and I think, you know, we're all used to the likes of YouTube and, and the ability to, to, to change, um, you know, to, to go to a point in a video or uh, an AV file um, that you choose. And actually, Kathy, great news because uh, that functionality is coming in Preservica uh, in our next product release, which is due for release in June timeframe. Okay, so hopefully you've got some questions for our speakers. Before we go on to the Q&A, um, just a couple of next steps for you here. So um, all the great training resources and all of the, uh, including all of the upcoming um, webinars programs that are part of this a practical digital preservation program, all available and accessible to register on the PERTS portal, uh, the stakearchivist.org site there. Um, there's a whole host of resources available on the Preservica Resources Center, uh, white papers, webinar recordings, uh, industry benchmark reports. Uh, so pop along to preservica.com forward slash resources to find those. Um, if you're interested um, in seeing uh, what Preservica the product um, uh, and see how it works. Uh, we do have a live demo and we run these every few weeks. The next one is this Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern, so please do register for that if you're interested in seeing the, the product in action. Um, Preservica is going to be attending uh, these upcoming events, COSA, Nagara and SAA, uh, so please do pop along and see and meet our team at those events. Okay, so we're going to move on to some questions now. I'm just going to see if we've got any uh, in the Q&A box. Okay, so so I'm going to start with a question uh, from Alan. Uh, Kathy, do you have or have you created transcripts from the digital audio or the digitized audio, or does another entity do complete transcripts? Um, am I unmuted? I hope I am. Um, we do not produce transcripts. Our, the log sheets we produced are very detailed, so they almost serve as a transcript. 
um, and we do not have an outside service doing that for us. There are users, I know since so many of our users are law firms, um, they will go and, and create um, their own transcripts from the recordings uh, for use in their cases and in court. But we do not do that. That would be, this is such a huge program, that would be just time and cost prohibitive to go back and do that. And we feel that our uh, log sheets are, are, we're providing very, very good information. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, so the next question is from Veronica. Um, it's for Kathy and Rachel. So if we put this to Rachel first of all. Um, Rachel, did you undertake your digitization in-house or outsource the projects? And did you use any specialized metadata schemas? Um, we, most of our digitization was done out of house. We did have, um, we did have a technician here on staff for about eight years that handled some of the very fragile pieces. We had quite a large collection of recording discs from a radio station. And so much of that material was, was digitized in-house. Um, the, the information, so most of our metadata has come from a database that was kept, has been kept for 20 plus years. Um, and so we are pulling metadata out and we're using um, Dublin Core is, is the schema that we're using right now. Uh, for Tennessee, um, we have done everything ourselves. Um, we have the coordinator of our legislative recording program has developed great expertise. Um, I think he's got something like 32 years of service with us, um, and he is our AV specialist, um, and he does all the digitization um, of these recordings. Um, as far as we don't use any particular metadata schema, um, the log sheets are the metadata, um, and they're sort of a thing unto themselves um, for right now. Um, we will be looking at, as we look into to online access, how we can best provide um, that data other than in uh, a text format. Um, so that's still an open question, I would say. Okay, thank you both very much for those answers. Um, so the next question is from Thomas. Um, I'm going to open this up to everyone on, on all of the speakers. Uh, what can you say about DCP digital cinema packages and DCDM digital cinema distribution masters? Does anyone, can anyone provide any uh, feedback for Thomas on that? My, this is Kathy, I, I cannot. Okay, okay, so Thomas, I think what we'll have to do for you is uh, come back to you offline uh, with a response to that question. Okay, guys, so any more questions? Give you one more chance to, to put any questions in. Um, okay, so we've got one from Elizabeth. Uh, this is for Rachel. Uh, Rachel, are you using Preservica services for preservation or front-end delivery? Uh, we are actually using them for both. So our, our, our uncompressed files are all being preserved, and we're actually in the process right now this month of migrating um, all of our documents and photographs out of a content DM installation um, into our Preservica preservation or into our production module in Preservica. Um, we at this point are still sort of working on, we, we definitely have collections of materials and things turned on in universal access. Um, we have it's because of because of some of those larger issues I, I said about that we're having with metadata, um, and just the I mean there's tens of thousands of files, um, so 
we're continuing to kind of organize and move things around. We're not in production. Um, we're kind of in a silent phase with the front end, but our intent is before, because we're an academic institution, before the fall semester starts to be fully using um, the Preservica front end. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, okay, so last call for any questions, guys. Um, so we've got a question from Liz. Uh, for Tim, uh, do you have any closed captioning capability? Uh, yeah, here the thing about cl uh, things like closed captioning and multilingual captions and things like that, um, really, if you if that is one of your requirements, what what you really need to do is research the various containers that um, are available. And you know, I actually I was looking at that um, recent uh, recently, just trying to understand more about. Uh, and I I think that the MKV video container. Uh, does have some capabilities for uh, for subtitles, multi-lingual multi, um, subtitles, um, closed captioning, um, that kind of thing. It's it's a it's a newer and more advanced container, um, and I I think that uh, you know it would be worth a little a little time uh, on uh, Wikipedia or something reading up on it because I think that that might get you where you need to be. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, okay, so unless there's any final questions for the guys, um, just notice as well that Rachel's actually posted a link to um, to the Berea Access site in the Q&A um, chat box, so please do check that out. Okay, so um, there's a question come in from... Mary. Um, Mary's asking, as a so Mary says, as a complete novice in AV, um, but needing to deal with its preservation, where would you recommend starting? So maybe this um, can start this with uh, with maybe some examples where you know where the guys, where Rachel, maybe where you started um, from from your starting point, and maybe hear from um, uh, from Kathy as well. I feel like I'm a lesson in where not to start. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess my advice would be is is to take as twice as much time in your planning phase as you think you might need. <laughs> um, we were so our our funding used to run on annual cycles, which I know is is, is probably very common to all of you, um, but we would get tied into these 12 month processes and and it would be coming to the end of the 12 months and there would be this great crush and then decisions sometimes would be made. Um, so I think, I think as a novice, that's, that's part, of which, part of what I wish I had understood a little bit more. Talk to people, see, see what, they're, what they're using, how it's working for them. I'm, I'm very happy to talk to people about our experiences. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for sharing uh, that, Rachel. Kathy, go ahead. Uh, I would say basically the same, and we're always happy to talk to folks, and I'm happy to um, let people speak with our AV specialist. I mentioned before, his name is Greg Yates, and he's amassed quite a great store of knowledge over the years. Um, but it's really uh, sort of a just put it together as you go, sort of um, find out what other institutions are doing and talk to them and see what you can glean from what they're doing. Um, one thing we ran into was, well, this is such an old program and it's been going on for so long and it's, it's sort of like turning a big ship around. It's hard to make changes. Um, and we found as we got out there and talked that there weren't many institutions that were doing exactly what we were doing, but we were able to take enough and learn from others enough um, to be able to draw some good conclusions, um, especially from there was a, um, 
a grant, Library of Congress, NDIP, grant that we participated in with some other states that were doing um, similar legislative related projects like Minnesota um, and that was very helpful. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Kathy. Um, okay, so another question uh, from Ruth. Some really great questions here, guys. Um, so Ruth says, for those of uh, you using cloud storage for master AB files, are there any problems recovering um, such large files from the cloud? Um, Rachel, let's start with you. Um, it takes a long time to pull something down off of Glacier. I mean, time is probably the biggest. We haven't we've and we haven't taken much out. Um, we have. You know, obviously we have we have access copies, and that's what gets used. Um, I don't. I I think that we have had to pull a few things out to, to you know, for um, for for users that needed the uncompressed. But so far, I mean, we're not having a major technical issue. Like we can't get it back out or anything. Um, but it just it takes it takes time for it to be downloaded. Yeah, absolutely, and I think you know it, it's going to depend on um, you know how what, what content and how you want that content to be used. So obviously, access formats um, can be store, stored on a, a lower, a faster, and low latency storage, um, such as Amazon S3, and that's going to be quicker to get to to, to get access to. Um, but there's going to be a cost implication versus lower cost um, cold storage, which uh, um, is an example is Amazon Glacier, uh, which Rachel just referred to there. So it's really a question of weighing up and balancing between the frequency of use and um, the cost um, of that storage and access uh, is, is going gonna, is gonna to cost you. Okay, so that looks like that's it from the questions front. So, um, so I think that's been a great session. I'd like to say a huge thank you to uh, all of our speakers who have joined us today and shared their stories and insights. Um, a big thank you to all of you and for everyone who asked the question. Um, I think um, yeah, it's been a very useful session. I hope you found it useful and uh, relevant. Um, as always, and as Sarah mentioned, we do appreciate any feedback you have for us. So uh, when the survey uh, pops up after you close this session, uh, please do complete that. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending, and I wish you a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. <laughs>